Small and medium enterprises play a major role in most economies, particularly in developing countries. SMEs account for the majority of businesses worldwide and are important contributors to job creation and global economic development. They represent about 90% of businesses and more than 50% of employment worldwide. Formal SMEs contribute to up to 40% of national income, that's the gross domestic product, in emerging economies. These numbers are significantly higher when informal SMEs are included. According to estimates, 600 million jobs will be needed by 2030 to absorb the growing global workforce, which makes SME development a high priority for many governments around the world. In emerging markets, most formal jobs are generated by SMEs, which create seven out of 10 jobs. Africa has an estimated population of more than 1.3 billion people that's growing at over 2% annually in most countries, with more than 50% of the people in many countries below the age of 25. This population has a growing need for the services, jobs, and economic growth provided by locally-based SMEs, yet these enterprises face an array of challenges that far outstretch those of their counterparts in developed countries. While there are big challenges, there are bigger opportunities that await Africa if we can harness the potential of our businesses to not just do business across the continent, but to take things global. Today, we're looking at how African businesses can go global. I'm Tolu Lokwe, Adela Rubalogun. Welcome. This is Business Edge. Joining me today is Dr. Nicholas Okoye. He is the founder and executive chairman of the African Enterprise Initiative. Uh, Nicholas Okoye, thank you so much for joining me, and it's a pleasure to have you on Business Edge. Thank you for having me. So let's start with this. We heard that you recently signed an MOU with Nigeria's Ministry of Industry, Trade, and Investment to launch the African Enterprise Initiative, which comes under the African Enterprise Institute. The focus is on repositioning, recapitalizing, and restructuring African enterprise for global markets. But when you put the re in front of some of these words, repositioning, recapitalizing, it makes you ask, what's wrong with how African companies and African businesses are positioned right now? Uh, well, that's a good question. The, um, the African enterprises, uh, for now, uh, are at the fringes of the global economy. We're not we're not participating in the global market pace. So even within the African countries, take Nigeria, for instance, some of the largest companies in Nigeria and some of the companies uh, that extract the most value are foreign-owned and foreign-operated. You're, you're looking at the Shells, uh, Mobil, Chevrons of the world, uh, as far as the oil and gas uh, industry is concerned. Uh, these companies take about 70 to 80% of the value out of that particular industry. And they're not owned by Nigerians. They're not controlled by Nigeria. And that is the case across the board, almost in every industry. Even in the information technology industry, you still have uh, the Hewlett Packards of the world dominating Microsoft and so on and so forth. And, and in the agricultural sector, you have companies like, like Olam, uh, uh, PZ, and so on, dominating in that particular uh, value chain, Presco, and so on. So what African companies need is how do we get in, in, into the actual, uh, uh, not just the global supply chain, but also the value chain of, of, of businesses and, and be able to extract much more value. The, the whole idea of extracting value means that you get access to the top jobs, you get access to you know, the, uh, the influential investment and the investment that can actually change uh, the infrastructural environment of your nation state. And then you obviously are able to push uh, your economic development on a sustainable level. Mm. Because when those big companies that continue to dominate the economies of Africa, uh, when they continue to operate in the nation state, they extract the value and they take away most of their earnings and invest it in their home country. Mm. You know, uh, taking the oil and gas industry again as an example, uh, when you look at Mobil, ExxonMobil, Chevron, Shell, they don't own 
assets in Nigeria, almost all the assets they use in the oil and gas industry are leased. They don't even own the buildings that they're operating in terms of their headquarters and so on. And so that just tells you what the, what the mindset is uh, from a foreign, um, a foreign company perspective. So we okay. need African companies controlled and managed and operated by our own people uh, to get involved into the commanding heights of industry. All right. And how do we do that is to, is to focus on the capacity, bring the capacity up to the level where our people can understand how to engage globally, mm -hmm. how to raise funding mm -hmm. uh, on a global uh, perspective, and how to attract the kind of global skills that are required uh, to operate companies at that kind of level. So you've mentioned three phrases that are very vital. We're going to get into the value chain conversation. Uh, capacity is also part of that. And you also mentioned sustainability. We're going to more than 1.3 billion Africans, the youngest continents, young people who are looking for jobs that are not the traditional jobs anymore. It's not enough to ask young people to pick up a hoe and cut less and do the traditional ways of farming. You need more from them. But let's also look at what some of the work the African Enterprise Initiative is doing, and that's to build capacity. Uh, for Nigerian entrepreneurs. As it stands now, what do you think is holding the Nigerian entrepreneur back the most? When you talk to small business owners, they'll talk about laws, they'll talk about regulations, they'll talk about a lack of enabling environment, they'll talk about lack of business knowledge, let's also give them that, lack, lack of access to loans and facilities, financing, lack of electricity. But primarily, what do you think is holding back Nigerian entrepreneurs? A, um, a very good question again. I, I think that you have to look at it from both sides. So there is Lack of capacity even on the, uh, on the government side. There's lack of capacity on the entrepreneurial side. Uh, and both folks, and um, 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 both players on both sides need to upscale their capacity to even understand what is required in order to, to build companies to a level where those companies can benefit the national economy. Mm -hmm. So on the, uh, let's look at the, um, the entrepreneurial side, for instance. Um, you do have a lot of folks um, let's break it into, okay, for the startup and those who are already in business. On the startup side, you have a lot of folks who come up with very unrealistic uh, ideas, ideas that are not commercially viable. And so, um, so when you say they don't have access to capital, um, you have to look a bit deeper at what, what are the kind of ideas that they're bringing to the table that the folks with capital, the investors, are not taking advantage of. Mm. Some of those ideas might not necessarily be very commercial. They might be great ideas uh, for hobbies and so on. And so what we need to do is to help them, and that's what we want to do with the African Enterprise Initiative, to help them to understand the difference between a commercially viable business model and a regular idea that can stay as a business hobby, for instance. And then you look at the government side, the folks who are responsible for helping SMEs or helping entrepreneurs through the transition uh, these folks need to understand themselves. How do you guide companies uh, from, from a micro business into a small business, from a small business into a medium business, from a medium business into a large business, and from a large business into a global enterprise? Uh, that transition has to happen. Uh, a big challenge we have in Africa, and especially in Nigeria, is that even for those that have been in business for a while, and um, they have done very well in the business space. As soon as the founder uh, dies or yes. is no longer with us, you find that the second generation cannot sustain the passion and the momentum and even the capacity planning. Of, of the founder. Yeah, and so uh, um, we go from founder to undertaker <laughs> in, in <laughs> Africa. And uh, many of the companies that we grew up with, um, like Ekenedi Chuku, if you remember, that was one of the biggest transport companies in Africa. It doesn't exist today. Uh, anymore. And, and we are seeing a lot of family businesses going in that route. So one of the interventions that the African Enterprise Initiative will be undertaking is to, is to look at this family business model and help families to build a sustainable model. And by training those successors, let the, the, let the families identify successors, let's manage those successors through the program so that that enterprise can be sustainable, not just locally, but even on a, on a global basis. And that's a very valuable note because some of the companies that have um, the most potential or not even the potential, the highest earning power around the world, these are companies that are hundreds of years, 75 years to almost 100 years plus old and you've seen the succession 
how they've handed over from one person, even if it's not a family member, to the next, and the family continues to stay on the board and they grow. I want to quickly Absolutely. touch on the African uh, free continental uh, trade area as well, and that's another point of call for the A. Uh, the AEI. So over a marketplace that has over 1.3 billion people is coming. It has arrived. It officially kicked off January the 1st, 2021. There's still a lot of conversations being had and a lot of things coming on board as countries are just ratifying the instruments along that. But when we look at how we need to make companies both in Nigeria and across the continent successful using AFTA, how can that be done? You've done it before. The Annabelle Mobile Limited, which was under the Annabelle Group, was Nigeria's pioneer tier one manufacturer of smart mobile devices. So you have businesses under you that you've managed to become pioneer status and, of course, um, go into the markets and beyond, the, uh, beyond Nigeria. How does Nigeria take advantage for its businesses so we can also become continental players? Well, good. So, so first of all, let's understand the size of the market. So the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, most of the documents that you read will tell you that Africa has a $3.2, $3.3 trillion marketplace in terms of the GDP. Um, but they're, what they're not doing is that they're not calculating it in terms of purchasing power, power parity. Mm. So under the purchasing power parity, which means that you have to look at your actual spending and purchasing power within Africa. Uh, purchasing power parity compares a price of breakfast in Lagos versus the price of breakfast in New York or London. And you can always know that you're not going to spend, if you spend $20 for breakfast in New York, you're not going to spend up to, up to 2 or $3 for breakfast in Lagos. Mm. And so with purchasing power parity, the actual size of the African GDP is $6.6 .6 trillion. Wow. And so that's the figure that I prefer to use because that is really exactly the size of the African market using our local economy and our local services. And so how do we, how do we um, integrate in, into that? Now, the good news is that there's already a lot of supply chains within the African space. And one of the things that the African Enterprise Initiative wants to do is that we want to point young people, and not just young people, even retired people who are looking for a second career. Mm. We want to point them in the direction of where the value is. Take the education value chain, for instance. There are thousands of schools, secondary, primary, uh, and tertiary institutions across Nigeria and across Africa. Every single school in Nigeria that we have visited, uh, you have every single student has a school bag. Every single student has a pair of sandals. Every single student has a pencil, a pen, and so on. So there's an entire value chain of products that are required in the educational space. But in Nigeria, and I use Nigeria as an example because that's where we're starting, all the bags, and most of the bags that are used in, in the schools are, are imported you know, from China. And, and so it tells you that, uh, and these bags can be produced here. In fact, some of the, the production facilities that we have looked at in Aba and in Kanu can actually supply the entire education value chain in Nigeria. But no effort has been done to integrate the, the market demand mm. and the market production. And that's just one industry. Uh, you know, the, the, the opportunities across the board. Look at the, um, look at the uh, automobile industry, for instance. There are about 12 million vehicles applying the roads of Nigeria. And out of that 12 million, you know, more than half of them are commercial vehicles, buses, trucks, and so on and so forth. There was a huge attempt um, by Newe in Anambra State to be the, the main production supplier for spare parts, that attempt did not get the kind of support it required. But if you have 12 million vehicles, every single vehicle in Nigeria needs to be serviced every three months. And when you service, you're looking at changing, uh, changing uh, brake pads, changing gaskets. Uh, yes. You know, all kinds. And all these things are imported. You know, so the, the, we're not taking advantage of the, the value chain of most of the industries that are already operating within our environment. And okay, so Nicholas, let me, let me pause you. We need to take a break. And I like that we're getting into this value chain conversation because across the continent, Africa is the country where people come for the raw materials. But after the materials are taken, they're brought back to us finished. How do we start to bring the value we have along this chain and make money for the continent? The conversation on how African businesses can go global will continue right after this.
My guest is Dr. Nicholas Okoye, the founder and executive chairman of the African Enterprise Initiative. Nicholas, right before we went for the break, we started the conversation on that value chain issue. And here on the continent, um, as you pointed out, we can look at the crude oil situation in Nigeria. We can look at the cocoa situation in Ghana and the Ivory Coast. We can look at the diamond situation in Central and Southern Africa. There are many, many examples across the continent of where raw materials come from us and they're brought back to us, either finished or we find the finished product on the international market. And you were going into how Africa can really take advantage of the value chain. So how do we address this issue across board? It's one of the most fundamental issues because addressing the value chain allows us to bring in more jobs and also to make more money for our economies. Uh, yes. So the, the value chain in these specific industries that you have mentioned, and it's, it's not just uh, oil and gas and cocoa, mm. it also goes across the board. Even Gary now which is made from cassava, is being produced in China, in China and sold yes. back to us here in bags and in Europe. You know, um, I, I think there is a leadership failure, if you will. Mm. Um, and I'm talking about leadership both in the business community uh, as well as in the public sector. Um, we have become, in Africa and in Nigeria, we've become a bit lazy. And that laziness is that there is a source of funding coming from somewhere, which is, you know, you sell the crude oil, the money's coming in, let's just share it. And that laziness has fueled uh, the, the um, uh, or rather created this gap. And, you know, nature upholds a vacuum. So folks like the Vietnamese, when it comes to cashew, all the cashew that is made in Africa produced in Africa is actually processed in Vietnam, mm -hmm. you know, and then you talk about the Chinese who are now moving into uh, cassava processing into Gary and um, crude oil we know has been processed internationally all these years. We've had all these foreign companies that are producing our oil and none of them has ever built a refinery in Nigeria, you know, from the Shell to the, the ExxonMobiles to the Chevrons of the world. Um, you know, and cocoa is the same problem we have in Nigeria as well as in Ghana and um, Côte d'Ivoire. So what we actually need is you need to, in order for you to really take advantage of the value chain, you need to identify your customer base. So there has to be a clear attempt to link the customer with the production. Mm. And that is where we have not really taken, taken advantage of. So if we identify the customers, we actually, at the African Enterprise Initiative, we're doing something similar now with cassava, where we have actually identified uh, customers internationally in Asia and in the United States for high-quality cassava flour. And um, what a lot of people don't know is that high-quality cassava flour is being used in the baking industry across the world for one major reason, it's health benefits. It has, um, it has a, a, a very huge, a very large, uh, low uh, content of, of, of gluten. And so what um, uh, customers are doing in the Western world is that they're looking for gluten-free flour mm. and they have shifted to cassava flour. Mm. And uh, Mexico and a few of those South American companies are beginning to supply uh, high quality cassava flour to these Western markets. So we've identified that and we said, okay, now that we've identified the market, can we supply that market by processing the cassava in Nigeria and exporting it uh, to the United States or to uh, Asia as the case may be? And so that initiative is on as part of the African Enterprise Initiative. But we intend to do that across, across the board in, in different uh, product segments and in different industries. But okay. the key is to identify the market. If you can identify the market, and then you can do the processing to meet the quality that the market expects, then you have a complete value chain. You said a word that in many instances we don't always hear with business, but it's a pivotal word, and that's leadership. It's leadership that designs regulatory frameworks. It's leadership that designs policies. It's leadership that can um, talk about financing and make it mandatory for banks to have a certain amount of their deposit ratio that they loan out to small and medium scale businesses. But you've also said that you believe leadership here in Nigeria and across the continent has gotten lazy. How do we address this issue? Many people say that more people who have done business successfully need to get into government because they know where it pinches. And there are many people who are technocrats in government 
governments who say that, no, we can still understand and find a way to build capacity. I know that the African Enterprise um, Institute and the initiative is also going to be working with private and global partners as well. So there's leadership, there's collaboration. How are you bringing this to bear in order to make it the best for African businesses? Okay, so the, yeah, the leadership is a huge, huge part of the solution. And um, I, 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 what, what we try to do is we understand that leadership requires support. Nobody in any particular office or power knows everything. Everybody has specific uh, knowledge on a specific sector. And then you bring in folks who have knowledge in other sectors. That's the role of leadership. So you have to commend the current leadership, for instance, at the Federal Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment. They have understood that there's, there's a need for a collaboration with the private sector in order to expand the opportunities. And they have asked us to work with them in order to do this. But on a, on a larger scale, what we want to do with the Institute is to support states as well as other federal departments. And then subsequently, across the African uh, continent. Mm. Because we know that you can't know it all. And so what we want to do is give leadership an opportunity to fill the weaknesses, the, the, the gaps that they have in order to create these opportunities uh, for our people. Some of the low-hanging fruits, there are some opportunities, for instance, that are, are, are very obvious, um, and which is one of the reasons why we, we chose specific industries. Uh, take, for instance, the information technology industry. Uh, you can actually operate an army of information technology experts in Nigeria, and they are servicing global companies across the world. Exactly. A lot of them are they're doing that in India already. What do you need to do? You just need to train these people to the world-class standards and skills that are required. As soon as they get that training, in fact, I have one or two friends that are doing it now, as soon as these folks get certified, they're getting jobs in Australia, they're getting jobs in Germany, they're getting jobs in, in the United States. Immediately, they get their certifications. We can do it on a broad scale. Mm. The same thing with the medical community. Anybody that gets a medical license in Nigeria gets snapped up. If you remember during the lockdown, in COVID-19 lockdown, there, were, there was a plane that took about 200 Nigerian doctors to London, and they broke all the rules. They, 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 they let them in, even without visas, <laughs> because, because they the need needed medical doctors in the UK. So there are specific skills that are global skills. Yes. And those skills are the skills that we need to help our people with. Another right. area is, of course, music and entertainment. It's already happening. Everywhere you go, the last time I was in Washington, D.C., they were playing... Uh, uh, Davido in, in, in the Starbucks store. I mean, that's the All music. right, Nicholas. <laughs> I can see that I've, I've sort of hit the nail on the head as to the area where you're passionate about. And I think it's a conversation we're going to have to continue to follow up. We're going to be watching to see the work that the African Enterprise um, Initiative is doing in regards to this, especially as the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement has kicked off and we're looking to take African businesses global. I have to say a very big thank you to my guest for today, Dr. Nicholas Okoye. He's the founder and executive chairman of the African Enterprise Initiative. They re recently signed a memorandum of understanding with Nigeria's Ministry of Trade Investment as well. And there's a lot of things happening in regards to that, so we'll be keeping an eye on that. Remember what the statistics are telling? We're going to need more than 600. <laughs> More than 600 million jobs. That number, yeah, it makes anybody uh, pause. More than 600 million jobs by 2030 to absorb the growing global workforce. And a large percentage of that is going to be needed here on the continent. We're going to take a quick time out when we come back. NC4 to watch. And before I leave you today, let me give you a few stories that we're keeping our eyes on, four stories to be exact. We start on the southern part of the continent where Ithekwini, the South African municipality that includes the port city of Durban, has become the first in the country to seek proposals for private power generation. The municipality has requested for information for the supply of 400 megawatts of power in a bid to ease reliance on national utility ESCOM. 
Now, this move will allow the city of 3.8 million people, which houses Africa's largest port, to get more energy from renewable sources rather than just ESCOM. The weekly Mombasa tea auction, which held recently, had 12.8 million kilograms of tea offered for sale. The amount on offer increased from 12.6 million kilograms for the same period last year and from 13.6 million kilograms offered during the previous sale. Of all the tea offered for sale, 11.7 million kilograms were sold compared to 10.5 million kilograms for the same period last year. The East Africa community has announced that it will focus the 2021-2022 financial year on economic recovery through industrialization and inclusive growth following the effects of COVID. Kenya's Principal Secretary for the East Africa Community, Kevit Desai, said that the region is putting in place strategies to ensure economic recovery in all partner states from the destructive effects of the pandemic. And finally, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Secretary General Wamkeli Meni has announced that the launch of the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System would save the continent an estimated $5 billion annually. The system is a centralized payment and settlement system created to serve the purpose of low-cost and risk-controlled payment, clearing, and settlement systems under intra-African trade. And that's today's show for you. Don't forget to head to our YouTube channel and also download our mobile app on your Play Store and App Store if you've missed any of our conversations on the global economic, financial, and of course business conversations as they relate to the continent. You can also watch us live on Star Times 274. I'm Tolu Lafue. I'll see you next time.